Welcome to Uncorked and Uncut, email marketing friends at home, a vodcast with a new guest each episode, and your hosts, Kath Pei and Ryan Phelan. Well, hi, and welcome everyone to um, our second uh, episode of Uncorked and Uncut. And uh, we're really, really excited to have here with us today, Kate. And uh, what we're going to be doing is we'll just do a quick introduction of ourselves so that you know who we all are. And then we're going to be asking and just, you know, Kate a whole heap of wonderful questions because she's unbelievably interesting. And um, we're just going to be having a bit of a chat. So, and hopefully at the end of the day, you're going to get to know more about Kate and what she does in the email industry, but also what she does in her personal life as well. So, Ryan. Yes. Good morning or afternoon, evening. Would you like to introduce yourself? We're pretty much we're pretty much covering all of the greetings in one with good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Excellent. Um, <laughs> hi, friends. That's Ryan Phelan, uh, and really excited to be here today. Uh, Kate's a good friend of all of ours, and just one of the uh, uh, rising stars in the industry, and, and really excited to uh, to talk today. So, how are you doing, Kate? I'm doing so well, mostly because I am getting to spend my afternoon and your morning with you two. Um, it's I, I'm just so delighted. That's I know I've said it to you two before, but I feel like the email industry is uh, is a pretty pretty special one. So I'm I'm stoked to be here, just hanging out with you two, and uh, it's a beautiful rainy afternoon here just south of Amsterdam, <laughs> and uh, doing some some fun crafty things, enjoying. A uh, nice afternoon beverage. Nice. Oh, what are you drinking? This. I am drinking pretty close to an old-fashioned. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. What have you got lined up there, Brian? I, I've just got iced tea because it's uh, like uh, 10 to 9 in the morning. So. <laughs> what about have... you, Melissa? Come on, come on. I, you know what? So uh, uh, my in-laws moved in and somebody drank the orange juice. <laughs> oh dear. So straight champagne seemed like over the top, but maybe if it's, maybe if it works out, I'll go grab just a, a, a Prosecco and just drink that. Excellent. Excellent. Now how about you, Kath? What are you drinking? I've got some um, lovely gin. Ooh, That's good nice. choice. Yes. What, what nice. brand? It's actually um, a brand, oh, I can't remember. I've got so many brands, I don't know which one I pulled out. I should know this. <laughs> I finished my Hendrix the other day, though. Oh, did you? That's my staple, yeah. So I'm one of these people, it's so funny. I've got the huge, like an enormous liquor cupboard. Uh, it's sort of just filled with every kind of liquor you can imagine and wine and all the rest of it. I don't really drink. Because I live here by myself, so I don't really drink. And so I rarely, really have it. It's only when people come over and everything like that. So you can always be assured there's lots of alcohol in my house. <laughs> making making a way. note of that. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to say. <laughs> so I can invite myself, go visit yes. Kat's house. Exactly. And it's here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, Kate, let's, let's, uh, let's jump in. I got a question for you that is plaguing all of the industry every time I talk to somebody about you. Oh boy, okay, what's the story? Why in the hell did you move to Amsterdam, for God's sakes? <laughs> oh boy, uh, it, I, I like doing things on a whim. Yeah. Um, honestly, it was, not, um, it was not premeditated really at all. I, uh, had, I had a great life in Colorado, that's where I was most recently. Um, moved at the start of January with my husband and our two dogs. And um, gosh, I bet, I wanna say probably around this time last year, um, just started talking about, you know, man, I, I, I would really like to spend more time in Europe and explore a little bit more. And uh, I, I just like trying new things. So uh, when was it back in 2014? traveled around New Zealand working on organic farms for the better part of a year. Mm -hmm. And I loved that experience. It was totally not my comfort zone when I started. And by the time I left, I didn't want to do anything else. 
And so coming back to the States was kind of just like a, hey, we'll put a, we'll put a peg in this and then come back to the States and just figure out what's next. And so last summer, I was really thinking more about, yeah, how can I travel more and how can I just put myself in new experiences and see different parts of the world. And more and more, I was thinking I wanted to get involved in the design industry. And yeah. as an artist and a musician, like I want to be involved in the arts somehow. And so that intersection of design and tech really appealed to me and wasn't looking for anything new. And I just happened to come across, of course, a job listing for a CRM marketing manager at Framer in the Email Geeks Slack team. Ah. And of course, it was Email Geeks that got me to move halfway across the world. And again, like just on a whim, applied and for a couple months just kept thinking to myself, well, it's not really going to happen, but just in case, we'll just, it's just good experience. We'll give it a go. Right. And then before I knew it, knew it I was, um, doing video calls with the team. I didn't actually get to come out to the Netherlands at all. The, moving here was my first time being here. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was cool. And, and my mom's family generations back is all Dutch. So I have always had a vested interest in um, Dutch culture and the language and stuff. So figured this was a good opportunity to dive right in. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So speaking as someone who has moved from Australia to England, I know the challenges, shall I say, <clears throat> to, um, to moving countries, right? But, you know, and my daughter, actually, she had spent uh, nine months uh, a year or so ago um, in, in the Netherlands as well. Oh, brilliant. Um, yeah, so the, the difference that we found, of course, is from Australia to England, <clears throat> English. And whilst the Dutch have, uh, a, a, they're amazing with their English. I mean, when I, I go to my clients in Amsterdam and, you know, English is the language that's spoken because I have a very international and diverse, you know, uh, employees, uh, range of employees that are working there. So it's a very international city in Amsterdam. And actually so is Utrecht, true. Mm -hmm. um, but... One of the things that my daughter found was, was just, it's like the, the difference in, in culture was actually quite, it was not what she thought it would be. She it's, thought that, she thought that Dutch were a lot more permissive and a lot more, you know, huh? and she said, but they're really, really quite conservative in many, many ways. And they like to have sort of, you know, set rules and they follow them quite strictly and everything. And she, you know, this is my daughter who's almost, I don't know, she's 27 and a bit hippie-like, you know. <laughs> it's just kind of like, there's rules I have to follow. Yeah. <laughs> how do do that? Yeah, really? so how are, you, how are you adjusting to all of that? It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I actually just had this conversation with my mother last night. Um, and she's, of course, her family going way back is all Dutch. Um, and she was asking the same questions. And I said, I found it really interesting in that the... Um, the Dutch and the Americans are kind of opposite uh, in that Americans say, well, we're going to have very strict rules, but we're all going to live as freely as we want to live. We want to do whatever we want to do. Whereas the Dutch are almost opposite. The Dutch say, you can do whatever you want to do, but certainly we won't. And <laughs> I totally get that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It is totally a cultural thing. And they're like, I've really... I've enjoyed it in that they're so direct. So you know exactly what to yes. expect. Like if somebody has a problem with something, they will let you know. You don't have to read between lines at all. No, no, that's fantastic. And that's something that as an Australian, we've always had that very much in common with the Dutch. And I think that's why we tend to get along quite well with them for, for that reason. The other thing that I had is that even though, you know, the English and the Australian would speak a language, and in fact, you know, England's supposedly like the mother country because we've been colonized by England and everything. We actually had, um, we had difficulty adjusting as well. And there was this amazing book that was called um, was like Watching the English. And I don't think I'd be here without that book, seriously. It actually gave me the reasoning, the rationale, the, you know, the whys and the hows and everything behind all these different rules and, and, and habits and things like that. So what kind of resource do you have? Is there anything or is it just talking to people? Is it just observations? 
Yeah, I, I'm so fortunate in that Framer is a super international company. So about 30% of the company are Dutch and another 30% um, from the UK and the US and then final 30% just kind of from everywhere else. And uh, the good thing about that is that the Dutchies in our company are so used to coaching people through, here's how you live here successfully. Um, and they're so open to sharing. So that's, that's been really helpful. Um, there was another book actually that I read years ago. It had to have been 2015 or 2016, I think just called Amsterdam. That, that was actually what initially prompted my interest in the country and in my own heritage yeah, and yeah. learning just about the arts culture and just how Dutch people interact with one another. And honestly, the, uh, geeks in Netherlands in the email geek Slack yeah. has been massively helpful. Like this, really? this community, yeah. Is everybody values. Yeah. 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 It's it's uh it's really cool. People have been so willing to help. And it's it's particularly fun for me because we don't actually live in Amsterdam. So we live about um 30 minutes south in a little city called Leiden, which appeals to me, first of all, because it's not a huge city, second of all, because that's where Rembrandt was born. Okay. And oh wow. Yeah, yeah. So I actually on on my on my walk to the train when I am taking the train to work, um, on my walk to the train, I pass uh, Rembrandt's birthplace, and there's like a little plaque on the side of a wall, and it yeah. it's just so culturally rich. But because it's not this big expat center, I intentionally wanted to live a place that was primarily Dutch, um, mm -hmm. so I'd be forced to learn the language. Um, People, I think I'm much more of a novelty as an American than I would be <laughs> in, in Amsterdam. So people have been so willing to help. I mean, just I have one coworker who lives in the city and he's just delighted to have an expat who's living mm -hmm. here. And all of our neighbors just are constantly asking questions, offering advice, helping us get on. So it's, it feels very welcoming. That's very cool. Do you yeah. find, you said earlier the the, the culture is very direct. It's not, there's not a lot of, of, of confusion on what people think. Do you, do you notice a difference between the, the political environment in companies, right? Cause there's always politics in whatever company you're working in and, and, and different stuff going on. Do, do you see a stark difference between the U S and the, and the, and, and, and where you're at? Yeah. And I, it's hard for me, because I have only worked at one company in the Netherlands and right. obviously I chose Framer because I think it's a great company. But um, I actually had a really interesting conversation with our CEO pretty early on when I was working there and we were talking about diversity and inclusion. And I told him that I really, one of the things that attracted me to Framer was that we put on an event um, that was keynote, I think it was keynoted, um, but I, I saw a talk by a trans woman that just completely blew me away. I was actually, um, I happened to be at Litmus Live in Boston, sitting in my hotel room, watching this talk about a trans woman talking about how you can design your life and how design is just like rewriting the rules. And it was so moving to me. I'm literally sitting in my hotel room between sessions, just sobbing. And I, I took that back, that, that made a big impact just in choosing to work at the company. And then I, I talked to our CEO about it later and I said, hey, I really admire the fact that we're showing so much leadership in the tech world comparatively to where I've mm -hmm. seen other places. And certainly we have a long way to go. And he actually looked at me and he was like, that's not leadership. He's like, that's putting somebody on a stage. He's like, that's, that is absolutely not the same as looking at your VCs and making sure that they're a diverse group from different backgrounds. He's like, you know, we've, we've got to start from the inside. It's really easy to just put people on a stage yeah. and like, it was so refreshing for me to have that conversation with him where there was none of the same like, oh yes, we're doing such a good job and we have a long way to go, but we're really, we're trying to be leaders. He's, the thing that I appreciate about our leadership is that they're very critical of themselves and always saying, look, like we got a long way to go and we're starting here, but let's not pat ourselves on the back for how far we've come because we have a ways. Yeah, oh, wow, that's great. Yeah, and it's very, very uh, topical with with what's happening at the moment as well. 
Yeah. 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 It's, it's, you know, this is what we're all being held to account. And particularly we as white people need to start looking at ourselves and start looking at what we're doing. And, you know, because the change really has to, has to be, you know, with us. So, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It totally does. And I, you know, I think sitting here together, the three of us got to know one another because we were put in leadership positions or invited to conferences that primarily are people who look like us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, to, to Kuhn's point, to our CEO's point, that's, that's great that we're talking about it, but man, we got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's, it, it is a case of, you know, I'm like just today, just uh, I've got a whole heap of things set up and everything that I am, but I, I've had these um, it, ready to implement because um, I'm, I'm doing something else as well. And, um, and it's all about, you know, um, making sure the inclusion is happening, make sure that the self-awareness is happening, make sure that I'm holding myself accountable as, like you said, as a, as a thought leader, um, as a leader in the industry, as a CEO of my own company and all the rest of it. And this is where, yeah, we have to start. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing that I find challenging, especially now is, you know, it's, of course, it's become a big bandwagon this week and you want to speak out and you want to be an ally on that bandwagon and say yes like I'm I'm part of this but also that's exhausting like I don't know about you guys but just looking at my social media feeds is exhausting for me right now yeah. and then framing it to think oh my god I don't even have to live it I'm literally just seeing it yeah. and so I one of the things that I actually did last night um is because I was thinking like okay i how can I help in a way that's not just uh, posting something on social media and in right. a way not just throwing money at a problem? Right. And so that's actually why um, you may see, I just noticed I have black paint on my fingers. Um, but I decided last night, um, I was doing some research about like ways to support and a friend of mine actually posted, you know, why do, let's lean into the things that we're good at and that keep us inspired and motivated. Because then if we lean into that and we lean into diversity in ways that we stay motivated, we'll continue to do it. So yeah. I and actually, I, I, I did a little Linacut print. So we were, <laughs> Ryan, we were talking about this earlier. Yes, you probably did do this in your kindergarten yes. class. <laughs> <laughs> Some research and I found, I don't know if you know that the protea flower. Yes. Um, but it's a it's a South Africa apparently it's a South African national flower, um, but it re represents uh, change and diversity and growth, and so I wanted to do a little um, I don't know how well you can see this, but I wanted to do a little oh yeah. cool wow um, yeah so I I figured I was like look uh, art is the thing that keeps me motivated and that's that's how I want to stay involved so I'm gonna try to find a way to to use this to raise money for a cause and hold myself accountable to keep making art for communities that you know need need the resources and need more voices over time not just this week so yeah, yeah absolutely that's great. So we want to come back to that in a second because you're gonna show us everything yes yeah. <laughs> but just to sort of I guess come back to what it is so you said you're leaning into your strengths and I think that's what we need to do and you know one of my strengths is is I do have a, a, a voice in the email industry mm -hmm. I do have a platform that I can call upon and so I'm really excited because I've just called up everyone this morning and, um, and you guys know that we don't have many black thought leaders or speakers in the right. email industry. no I've called upon them and we're going to have um, a panel discussion about uh, color diversity because I realized we've had, we've had, um, you know, um, uh, LB, you know, GT, we've, 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 we've had the, 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 um, you know, sort of panel and session on, on, on that as far as diversity goes, we've had the panel, many, many panel discussions on women, um, in email mm -hmm. and that's been since what three years ago or something before yeah. then we didn't have we've never had one on color diversity 
So and that's why I thought, okay, well, you know, gee, it's about time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it, to kind of chime in on your guys' comments, I think, Kate, you've got a, uh, I think all of us have, you know, things that we can control, things that we're good at, things that, you know, I've always believed you try and change the little world around you and hopefully it catches on to other people. And sometimes issues seem so big and so grandiose, it can, it can paralyze you into what you can do. And my solution has been, you know, on many things from uh, women in email to moving people up to mentoring people to all that stuff is I try to change the world around me and hopefully that catches on. That's and, right. and you did that with me, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and look where you are today, you know, but you, you were wait you were, you, 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 I didn't have to do anything. You, you were a, a leader when you walked into the industry and, and so proud of where you've, you've come to. I, I, um, tell, you, I tell you what, I, I've seen lots and lots, you know, I go to lots of conferences, yep. I've seen lots of speakers. I saw you on a panel first and I don't know if you remember it, but after it was in, um, it was in um, New Orleans. And, oh, I, yeah. and I just felt, I, I, I went up to you, didn't know you, and I just said, listen, you were brilliant. That was, I remember I, that. I identified then that you were, you know, that you had something. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even work out what it was, you know? I, I, did, I couldn't even identify, oh, that was brilliant. Like that. I just knew that there was, that it was yeah. the essence. Thank so. you. I remember that moment. That was actually, that was the first time I had ever spoken publicly. Right. And that's, I, because it was relatively new, not new to the industry, but new to knowing that there was an industry community. I, I recognized your name. And when you said who you were, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're somebody. You're, I gotta look, I don't have to look you up. Um, yeah. But I think, Kate, what you've done, and I think the opportunity is, and I've talked to people about this before, the opportunity for anybody in this industry to become a thought leader, and Kath and I have had deep discussions about this, the opportunity to become a thought leader is out there for anybody. We, it, it, I don't think there's any thought leader or somebody that's been around as long as we have cares who, who, who comes on, but there's certain characteristics, there's certain things about that person and I think the reason why you rose to the level that you're at is because you're authentic, because you give back, because, and that give back part is the most important part of anybody that we see in the industry is that you give back without thought to profit or favor. You give back because you want to uh, be the tide that lifts all boats. Yeah. Um, but you're kind, you're approachable, you're, shoot, every time I see you, you've just got this aura of, somebody that is incredibly trusting and wants to help people and is just here to say a few words. And, and I think that that's, that's what we look for in any, any influencer or anybody that has a name in this space is, you know, are you, are you authentic and, and do you want to help people out? That is the nicest damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's also is quite unique. So you bring that innovation with your, with your drawings, right? <laughs> Never yes presentation that everyone's not left going oh. <laughs> oh my goodness did you draw those they're amazing that you know it's just like everything so you're unique in that and that's just really and that also then shows though how much thought that you've put into everything too you know it's not you're not just dragging a few things in and right. oh this will do or anything like that you know it's real care so it's, yeah i i appreciate that so much and i think I, I want other people to do that more. And I, yeah, I really hesitated to kind of lean into the, the artsy kind of weird music nerdy parts of my personality in speaking. And really what got me to do that was, um, so Jason Rodriguez is a good friend of mine and, uh, Jason does that a lot in his work. And he actually, uh, he and I had a conversation pretty early on about, um, how he travels with a ukulele when he goes to conferences. Yeah. And he always brings his ukulele because for him, his way to wind down at the end of the day is just to go back to his hotel room and play a little bit of uke. And that's like, to me, when he said that, I was like, that sounds absolutely bananas, first of all. Second of all, I love it. 
And <laughs> it, it was like little conversations like that with Jason and then with Logan Baird and with friends of mine and, and Ann Tomlin and just people who really kind of lean into their weirdness and their uniqueness yeah. and people who do things a little bit differently, but in a very authentic way that I think when people see that modeled more and more, they realize, oh, I can, I can be myself on stage. I'm allowed to have that personality. But here's the, here's the funny thing though. And I think this is another trait of, of the mm -hmm. insiders is if you want to find the biggest concentration of insiders at a conference, go to the bar after the conference is done. We're all there. We all talk about our families. We all talk about kids and dogs and, and all that stuff. And we know each other on a personal level. It's not just, Hey, you were on stage and you said something cool. It was, Hey, how are you weird? And, and I mean, all of my friends, including, <laughs> you know, including Kath and all that stuff, we all know each other's personalities, but it's, it's the acceptance of that. And we're, we're all very, very good friends as well as being, people in the industry that have been here for a while that people choose to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's, that's actually, let me think about this real hard. And obviously this is coming from a, a point of privilege in that very few people I know have been affected in meaningful ways by the pandemic, but the, the hardest part about the pandemic as it pertains to my personal life is that I'm not getting to travel to conferences and pe see the people yeah. who really have made a big difference in my life. Yeah. 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 It's tough. Well, well I remember we we did the um so there was the conference recently the um email innovations conference mm -hmm. and we did um, Family Feud and <laughs> um, one of the questions was what's your favorite thing about the email industry and the um, the first answer. And I saw the actual results last night. The first answer with like 80% of, of responses were the people. Without a doubt. I, yeah, we, are, we, are, we are blessed. We really, really yeah, are. Yeah. 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 So you, you have mentioned art a few times. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a little project that we're going to look at with the, <laughs> with, the, with the thing. So why don't you tell us what your <laughs> a thing. thing. I couldn't remember it. It's not in my notes. I'm on the patio. Um, <laughs> the little piece of linoleum, honestly, that's what it yes. is. <laughs> yes, the flower. And, yeah, so I, uh, I love art. I like making things. I'm not classically trained. I don't do things the right way. I do things the way that it's fun and easy and keeps me feeling creative. So I don't actually know what's like what's possible to see. So I may just hold things up, but. Um, I, a couple of years ago, I did a project um, just to prove to myself that I could do it. That was called, uh, I think, 100, 100 Faces in 150 Days. And yes, I remember that. It was great. <laughs> it, was, it was nuts is what it was. Yes. I had absolutely no reason to do that then. I definitely don't now, now that I know how much work it was. But Basically, I just took a hundred of my Facebook friends, randomly exported. I let just Excel pick who I drew, and I drew each of their portraits um, over the course. I drew a hundred portraits over the course of 150 days, and that to me was the best exercise in just learning that it's okay to mess things up. So there were portraits that I drew because I was under such a time constraint. Um, I there were things that I drew where I wasn't happy with them, but I just drew them and I powered through and I said, okay, this is what this is. And mm -hmm. one of the rules that I set for myself, of course, arbitrary rules, is that um, you only got to draw things once and you had to post everything as soon as they were done. So, um, and some of the portraits for, were for uh, people who I hadn't spoken to in like solidly a decade and maybe didn't know that well. So there was a this fun extra like creepy aspect of it. <laughs> So, <laughs> like somebody draws, somebody draws like a hand-drawn pencil portrait of you that like took maybe a few hours, and you haven't spoken to them in years. Like, that, right? That's, that's a little, a little creepy. creepy. That's kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> but, There's a um, movie plot in there somewhere. <laughs> I, I right, drew this of you. <laughs> Am I the serial killer in the movie? Is that how it ends? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a weird project, but honestly, so revealing just in that, like, 
of course, that was the medium that I chose. I chose that because I wanted to get better at it. And as a result of that, I got a lot more creative in terms of what art I was willing to try. So I realized if I could do something for five months and just make that my full-time hobby for five months and just share everything, regardless of how happy I was with it, then the more and more art that I started to seek out in the yeah. world, right? I saw it and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if I could do that. I just started doing it. Um, all of that to say that there's an artist, um, Lily Arnold Studios. So she's, she's based in, um, I want to say Santa Cruz, California, but she does some really cool linocut printing. And the way linocut works, so you start out with like a little block like this. It's literally just like a block of linoleum. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's a variety of steps. So I kind of went through all, all this last night so I could show you the end, -end process. Um, but basically what you do is you start like you've got a block this big and then you have a little drawing so I just sketched this little protea I think that's how mm -hmm. you say it yeah, maybe you um but yeah you sketch this little guy out and um I decided yes I'm happy with it so what you do then is you take a block of um graphite paper something like this and you can see where I already transferred this but um it's graphite all on one side so you pop the graphite right there and then um, I feel like I'm on a kid's art show. This is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. And Creamer, can you show us how to make this? That'd be fun. Just... Yes, I can, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then you just take your little sketch right here and you pop it on top and then just take something and you might remember this from kindergarten, but literally you can just like kind of draw a little scribble right here. Just trace the outline of that. And then when you take it off, you can see that, I think you can see, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Where you scribble transfers. So you end up with a, with a transfer. So we could do like, if we wanted, um, let's try, if I draw just like a little, what do you think, Ryan? Should we do a, an email? Yes. An email -y thing? Email-y thing. There's That's the official. No hesitation there at all. That's the official term for the icon <laughs> is the emaily thing. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a really bad drawing of an envelope then, and you guys get to see that artists do not get it right on the first time. Um, well, that's actually really that really is. Yes. But whatever you're doing is ten times better than the stick figure I would have drawn. So. <laughs> oh, I disagree. The stick figure would have been beautiful, I'm sure. Okay, so we're just gonna do like a little. I just drew like a little envelope, right? Super okay. simple, nothing crazy. So we're gonna do exactly what I just talked about on a piece of used graphite paper, which I don't recommend, but for the purposes of demonstration. Okay. We'll take this graphite paper and then I'm gonna, of course you can't see this because we're not a cooking show with multiple cameras, but I'm gonna trace over this little envelope. I promise that's exactly what I'm doing. There's no black magic going on in the background. I can just picture Martha Stewart trying to do this. <laughs> Don't say that. That's awful. <laughs> and then, okay, we've got our envelope transferred. That's got it. a pretty envelope, but it is an envelope nonetheless. Okay. And then, so what we do, this is my favorite part because it comes with cool gizmos and gadgets. Um, ask any of my family members. I have a problem with art supplies. I have, I want all of them. I have most of them. <laughs> I like mm -hmm. it. I want. I heard that emphasis. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want all of them. Take me into an art store and it's just like a kid in a candy shop. So what you get is this little carving tool. And I'm going to try not to drop this all over myself. But so carving tool looks like this. And then it has like a little, it, it's almost like a drill bit at the end. Mm -hmm. And then you get all of these little bits with varying widths and shapes. And then if you really want to get crazy and just cut a whole piece of linoleum you get this awesome looking blade whoa uh -huh. i say awesome it's like it's the size of my pinky nail <laughs> uh -huh. and then so let's say we want to pick this little blade so we take that and then just put it in the end of our carving tool and just tighten it right up so there we go we've got okay. the tool and then this is not safe at all don't do this at home um <laughs> You, listen, if you, cut a, if you cut a finger off during this, it's going to go viral. I was going to say, you're going to get a thousand views. It works out well for everyone, right? Yeah. So, 
<laughs> on the table, ideally, you take a carving tool and like comment, this is really silly for me to say just in general, but common beginner's mistake <laughs> is use, <laughs> using the carving tool and pushing away, which is particularly dangerous because when you're pushing away with a blade, you're, you are apt to cut off digits. Um, so on the table, and I'm only going to do one up in the air because like I said, massively dangerous. So you take this guy and you literally just like pull into the linoleum much harder up in the air than it is on a table. I assure you, <laughs> yes. you but you, you see, you get this little linoleum piece. Yeah. yeah. Falls away. <laughs> so what we're going to do, and like I said, this is like two, three lines. It's really simple and therapeutic. And if you just want and exercise to help get away from the world. Um, carving <laughs> linoleum is a great way to do it, I promise yeah. you. Now, do you have music going when you do this or is it usually in silence? Oh, for sure. I nerded out real hard last night and listened to, um, <laughs> so I'm sitting, I shouldn't tell people this about my life. Um, I'm <laughs> sitting at my uh, dining room table listening to symphony music that I played when I was probably 15, 16 years old in Atlanta Youth Wind Symphony. Wow, um, what did you play? What instrument? Well, uh, it gets nerdier from here, Ryan. Uh, I got my degree in tuba playing. Tuba You're playing? You're kidding. Yeah, I'm no. gonna watch that in Celebrity Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why I did too? This is the silly, first of all, because I loved it. Um, so I started playing when I was 10 years old, but, uh, Second of all, because in sixth grade, we had an instrument try-on day at school where you got to try all the, all the different instruments and decide which one you liked. And my big sister played saxophone. She was infinitely cooler than me. She still is infinitely cooler than me. Um, and she played saxophone. And so I wanted to be cool like her and play the saxophone, but I could not make a noise out of it. And when I could not make a noise out of it, there was a boy in my class who pointed at the tuba and he said, imagine if you could play something that big, you could never do it. And uh, yes. so here we are. <laughs> you rose to the challenge. I did, I did and actually, um, so I don't know if you guys watch the Stephen Colbert show, mm, but- Every once in a while, yeah. The, uh, do you know the John Batiste band? Uh-uh. They're, so they are, they are the Colbert Show the house band. band. Yeah. Um, and Ibanda Ruhambika is the tuba player for that band. He's a good friend of mine who I've known since I was about this tall. He and I played in uh, all sorts of like all state bands and ensembles and stuff like that. He went on to play in Juilliard, but I, that is like my, my favorite name drop because he is a genuinely fantastic human being and a far better tuba player than I could ever hope to be. Wow. <laughs> wow. Excellent. Oh, that's really cool. So there's your like when random weird fact about me. Um, there we go. Alongside with our little. Oh wow! Little Brilliant. <laughs> so now that we've done that, we get this fun tiny little thing um, that, of course, has dog hair on it because everything in my house does. Right. Yeah, we're, we're still yet to talk about the dogs. <laughs> They're chaotic. That's that's most of the story. <laughs> but basically you take this little roller and a uh, sheet of paper that you roll a bunch of ink onto or acrylic paint or whatever you have handy honestly so here's a fun secret for you Ryan you may remember uh, in school doing something like this with mm -hmm. potato, potato stamps yes. are like yes. one of my most favorite things <laughs> yes we did them too they're, they're the best. I love them. So that's cool. Stamps are your entry to Leno Cut. Okay. Um, also, check this out. I'm getting more and more paint on my hands as I go. Awesome. So you roll, you roll your little roller in the paint, and then you have ink, and then you just take this guy. And this is actually really satisfying because then you start to see the contrast. Honestly, this is just like fundamentally making your own stamps, which. Yeah. Um, is really bougie and silly and super fun. Um, but there we have our little stamp. And then I'm gonna take some rice paper and just lay that on top. Honestly, computer paper works fine. And then take a pepper mill because that's what I have. 
did. Yeah. So <laughs> you put the stamp face up with the ink on it, lay the paper on top, and then just kind of roll it up the bill. Yeah. Oh wow. We're See back when, back when I was a teenager. Oh, that's amazing. oh, that's cool. <laughs> really, really cool. It's really simple but really fun. Yeah. See, back when I was a teenager, I used to paint t-shirts and sell them at the markets. Did you really? I should have done that. You should have. What did you paint on your t-shirts, Kath? Oh my goodness, I painted flowers, uh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, I just did a whole heap of things. It was mainly florals and stuff because I was a photographer as well. So I would yeah. use the photos as the basis and, and everything. And people used to buy them. <laughs> it's honestly like people, there's a, I feel like there's a market for all sorts of different art there. People has, have such diverse taste. Yes. That I think it's, it, it drives me crazy that people stop themselves from sharing their own art because you never know what people are going to like. And yeah. so even if something looks completely just bizarre yeah. to you or if something comes out wild, there's going to be somebody who looks at it and says, like, oh, that's like, that really is meaningful to me. See, right. that's it, isn't it? Art, it's, it's subjective. Yeah. So, so, yeah, you know, it might suit you and it might suit a whole heap of other people, but not those mm -hmm. other ones there. Because... That's, why, that's why I want this. One day, this will be worth like millions. <laughs> this little thing will be worth millions. I'll retire. That's that, was, that was like one of the most fun little paintings I did that year, actually. So, Kath, I'm sure you've heard the story how Ryan and I met on a fishing boat at uh, mm -hmm. Captiva Island for Media Post's EIS. Right. And um, this honestly perfect example of inclusivity in the industry um, for a white girl, granted. But um, I, I had the privilege of going on one of the excursions and I was at the event by myself. I didn't know anyone else, so popped out onto the dock and um, we, were, we were directed to find groups of four to go on a fishing boat. And fortunately, uh, Dan McDermott and Ryan Phelan and Dennis Damon were kind enough to, um, to invite me onto the boat after I said, I don't know anyone, can I please get on your boat? Oh. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and so that little painting was actually born out of that weekend. It was sitting on the beach by myself after the event had wrapped and just uh, feeling very welcomed in a space where I knew no one at first. Yeah. No, that's just like Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan and our, our history is actually quite funny because we knew each other's names, but for some reason had never yep. met. So we both knew everyone in the industry, but we'd never met each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then oh, one yeah. day we finally met, and then we've been the stick of Steve since, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. It's just been. I, I, Kath is one of my closest friends in the industry and just. Um, just amazing uh, person, and I'm just, it, it was funny. We just kind of, one day we're like, oh, that's you. And it was, from there has been, you know, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, lots of trips over here to London. Yes, yes, a lot of dinners, a mm -hmm. lot of, uh, that was one of the best uh, memories of me coming over to Europe all the time was, whenever I came over, Kath and the rest of the London crew uh, would get together for dinner somewhere. And yes amazing dinners my favorite was the greenhouse on top of the bar no oh my god brilliant wasn't it we had our own chef our own waiter it was amazing and we're in in uh, on top of this old pub in um essentially kind of in in shoreditch area yeah. and um yeah and uh just the greenhouse it was, it was so nice and the food mm -hmm. oh, and the food was amazing yeah, we gotta, we gotta go back there. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, when I come over, you know, as soon as we can all travel again. Yeah, okay, you're coming. Yeah. I was gonna say, let me know because flights are cheap as from here. Yeah. 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 At sure. this point, I don't care how much it costs. I just need to get the hell out of here. <laughs> I know. I feel that. I feel that oh. so hard. <laughs> well, hey, we're we're we we have talked for a long time. So a couple wrap up questions. So tell us about the dog and the husband and how they're acclimating to all of this. Yes. They are um, all, all three. So two dogs, one husband. All three of them are. Uh, I'm glad it's the other way around. 
<laughs> no, she put them in order of priority. We all know that the dog. No, I mean, I mean, I'm glad it's not two husbands and one dog because that would. Oh be yeah, crazy. no, that'd be odd. <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, I, you know, my husband was incredibly generous in basically. So he's he works in uh, satellites and mission ops in the space industry, or. That's, that's what he was doing in Colorado and really enjoying his work. Um, and then, of course, his, his lovely impulsive wife um, comes home one day and says, I want to sell the house and leave everything and start over for a job for me. And is that okay? Um, so, I didn't realize he sold you a house as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, did the, did the whole shebang. Gee. Um, wow, I'm going to have to think about how I'd react to that one. Hmm. <laughs> I'd probably do the same thing. I'd probably be like, okay. I'm fairly well, certain. You can work from anywhere, can't you? Yeah. Huh? Brian, you can work from anywhere. Yeah, I can work from anywhere. Yeah. So, so, so what's your husband doing now then? Um, <laughs> spoiling me rotten by keeping the house clean and keeping the dogs attended to while I work ridiculous hours. Um, not, not by virtue of the fact that I have to, but just because I really like what I do and I tend to be a little bit workaholic. Um, which nobody's surprised, I'm sure. But yeah, he's, he's learning to cook, uh, much to his own dismay. He's like, <laughs> he's the kind of person who um, probably wouldn't eat if his body didn't demand it. Right. <laughs> I, like the only reason I stop eating is because I occasionally have to do other things. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so he's, He's learning to cook and the the dogs are just going wild. They they love having us home all day and getting to go to the park and going for bike rides. They've recently learned the fine art of running alongside the bike. And of course in the Netherlands there are bike paths everywhere. So we can mm -hmm. bike everywhere we want to go. They run alongside and then they're just pooped for three or four days. Really? Wow, that's so, great. Yeah. So okay, so you, you said you you you're very busy, you're a bit of a workaholic. Yet, you know, I've seen videos of you cycling, taking the dogs for a walk, playing games with them, doing your crafts, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. How do you pack it all in? Seriously, I, I literally, I go, oh my goodness, she's this Wonder Woman. What, what is a, what's the story here? Uh, I don't sleep. Oh, uh, <laughs> nice. I mean, to be fair, so I actually had a friend in uh, in high school who said that I was an Olympic sleeper because I used to fall asleep sitting straight up in class in high school because I literally just couldn't, I couldn't stay awake. That was not a testament to like, that had no reflection on my teachers. I had amazing teachers, but I just like, when I'm tired, I sleep. And then when I want to make art or when I want to go for a ride, that's what I do. That's, those are the things honestly like that I do to recharge yeah and my my dad is very much the same way in that he always wants to have a project and something to work on and I find that at the end of a long day if I just like have dinner and sit in front of the tv I end up feeling more drained than if I just do the things that fill my mental and emotional cup and those things mm -hmm. just happen yeah. to be art and being outside and cooking and all those sort yeah. of things yeah, no, I'm, I I get that. I'm exactly the same. So, yeah. I'm not surprised a bit. You always have a thousand projects going on, Kat. Oh. Yes, she does. <laughs> now, Ryan, you're quite, you're quite the cook yourself. I, oh, yeah. I, I have, uh, I am self-taught and uh, with a couple cooking classes every once in a while, but um, yeah, I, it, it's one of those things, kind of like your art, right? The bigger the, the bigger the meal, the better the relaxing. Right. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, it's, 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 it's lovely. I really do like cooking. So, and I'd like you, I've, I've got, my kitchen looks like, uh, uh, a sur la top store. Uh, okay. I've got sur la top, sur la table, oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I, there's all kinds of gadgets I have and toys and stuff. So. Oh, nobody's surprised. What's the best thing you've made lately? Um, what I do, I did a Wagyu chuck roast in the sous vide for 24 hours. Wow. Oh my God. And it came out and everybody knows chuck roast really tough. 
really kind of, it's got a lot of yeah. fat, but it's yeah. really a tough piece. After yeah. 24 hours in the water bath, took it out and it sliced and tasted like a ribeye. Oh, gee. Oh. That sounds see, that's the thing about Ryan is he's, he's not scared of, of trying new things. And he showed me his recipe folder. And, <laughs> you know, because you, know, you know how we kind of, we've all got good, oh, that looks a nice recipe. Oh, that looks a nice recipe. So some of us may have put a folder like that together. But then I asked him, I said, so how many of those recipes, right, have you actually cooked? Yeah, all of them. Mm -hmm. Of course, so his range can. is enormous. Like my range is like minuscule. <laughs> it's like, like a five-inch binder, four-inch binder, or something like that. Oh. Ryan, are you serious? So yeah. So if your husband would like uh, easy, easy recipes, or hey, I'm learning how to cook recipes, I just need to know the protein and any ingredients you want, and then I will, I will put together a, a little book. Oh Lord, I I will pass the suggestion along. You're gonna have a lot of work to do. All right, that's fine. He's about to <laughs> up with all of the uh, involved recipes I keep sending. <laughs> oh really? Oh, I, some, some well, I got one more question for you though. Yeah, what you got? So I came to uh, Amsterdam uh, was eight years ago, nine years ago, or something like that. And the one thing I remember is that the Heineken tasted so amazing out of the cold tap. I had it for I had it for breakfast once in the airport, and it just it was, it was just so lovely. I believe that. Yeah, it's so good. Are you a are you a beer person? Mixed drinks, wine. What kind of what kind of what 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 do you usually go for? <laughs> that's a that's an excellent question. So living in it depends on the day. Honestly, I I hate to like cop out with that, but uh, living in Colorado for five years, yeah. I had my fair share of IPAs, hazy IPAs, all of that good stuff. And I, I, of course, I had so many good beers there, but also like just a good whiskey. There is mm -hmm. nothing that's better, honestly, in my, in my opinion, like, so if it's, if it's a wine night, like a Tempranillo, that'll, yeah. that'll do the trick. But like, a, like I said, a good whiskey, there is nothing better. There is nothing better. <laughs> Well, Kath, this has been yep. fun. Have you had fun? I've had fun. Have you had I fun, have. Kate? Very much. Good. <laughs> cool. Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck over there. Uh, keep in touch until the time where we can all go to a plane and go have dinner on the top of a bar in a greenhouse. Oh, yes. yes, absolutely. I have something to look forward to now. There we yeah. go. <laughs> thank you, Kate. Thank you both so thank much.